Hey, everybody, welcome to the podcast. If there was anyone who does not need an introduction today, it's today's guest, Matthew McConaughey. Everybody knows who this guy is. He was an absolute delight. Uh, This is an incredible conversation. He was so generous and warm and open. I'm so excited for you to hear it. Before we get into it, please hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and pick up Matthew's new book, Green Lights. It's an incredible read. It will not disappoint. And neither does this conversation. So without further ado, this is me and Matthew McConaughey. All right, all right, all right. Thank you so much for doing this. You ready to rock? Let's roll. So our point of introduction or inflection was our mutual friend, Dan Buettner, mm-hmm. uh, who pleasantly uh, in- introduced us. And we were meant to go on this backpacking trip in Utah, like this ultralight backpacking trip yes. that got canceled because of COVID. So I was I was looking forward to meeting you in person, but that's going to have to wait for another day. Well, our good man, Dan, is a good curator of uh, of people with, with like but challenging minds. I, I, you, know, I, you know, my nickname for him is GH. No, what does that mean? Generally uh, heroic, and I don't mean <laughs> just sometimes. I mean from four dimensions and 360 view, whichever view you want to take, he's generally heroic. Where did you first meet him? I met him, um, shoot, we were over, I think, in, uh, in Europe at a, at, a, at a Google weekend, a Google getaway, and he was one of the speakers. And uh, he was the uh, first speaker, I believe, and of the day of that so said day and what he had to say i remember listening to him just going that guy's got the greatest job in the world yeah he goes around studying longevity and happiness and people and culture and so i chased him down um and made sure i got his eyeline and shook his hand and met him and talked to him about some things and uh he continued uh uh to call me bradley cooper and then i think you know he (laughs) kind of went up and flirted with my wife and called her Mrs. Cooper. <laughs> uh-huh. That sounds like Dan. <laughs> Still generally heroic. And now he's rehabbing. He's rehabilitated. Did you see his latest fall? I did. I did. I'm going to go up and, and visit him up in Santa Barbara in a week or so. I told him, I said, a pothole in the middle of the street in Minnesota it just doesn't fit the meter of a, of, of a generally heroic Dan Butner wreck. For all the stuff that that guy's done, riding yeah. his bike across Saudi Arabia and everything, for him to get knocked down that way. But Wonderful. hey, man, happens to the best of us. But I, I reached out to him and I was like, what should I ask Matthew that is, you know, mainly not Googleable? And he said, some people think that Matthew is is heroic in a lot of areas, acting, fatherhood, ambassadorship, scholarship. Others think he's just generally heroic. <laughs> yeah. Care to okay. comment. So my so my boomerang came back, yeah. huh? Uh-huh. Um, that's all him. He's he's the purely GH one. Um, he just he calls me many nicknames. One of them, professor, I think, because I'm a professor at UT. Um, no, he's the generally her- heroic one. Uh, more so than me. So your question being what, how am I generally heroic? Or how do you respond to that? Can you take that compliment? How does that land for you? Mm. Well, I've always, I've enjoyed trying to entertain what the definition of a a hero is all through, through life. I mean, you know, you've got the, uh, what's always been said as they talk about, you know, or men and women who go off to defend to defend the country are the true heroes. And then you say there's heroes every day that that do good deeds. I don't know if that's heroic. Um, I'll say this on 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 any kind of heroism, whatever your definition is, whatever anyone's definition is. Um, when I got fame and success and started a. Uh, um, a foundation that we have at Just Keep Living After School Foundation that's doing very well. I didn't, I chose to do that. And whether that's heroic, I don't think it's heroic, but what I'm leaning into is this. Some people say it's a responsibility once you have success. You, you, it's your responsibility. I don't think that's true. I think it's a personal choice. Just like, uh, um, you know, every day the choices we make, uh, uh, I think 
should be very selfish. I don't think we make good choices for anybody unless it's mm -hmm. personal. So I don't, I don't, I don't know about the heroic. I wouldn't, I would consider myself a, a, a hero. <laughs> um, I'm, I've been fortunate to, to, and had an innate ability and worked my backside off to be at least pretty damn good at some things. Mm. Still got some things in the debit section. Uh, I will say this, my favorite job in the world has been a father. Um, I don't know if being a good father is a heroic job. I think it's just being a good father. So I don't know. I don't know what to do with the hero comment coming back from- Right, from, maybe, from, maybe it, I, it all depends on how you define it, how broadly or how strictly, I suppose. But more a conversation around, you know, how to be a man of character. I suppose. And the man of character, that you make. I'll take that. Yeah. You know, we can talk about that till all, all, all day long, you know, and even that is not a responsibility, but a choice. You know, the only thing I ever knew I wanted to be was to be a father in my life. And then I've also learned now that, okay, well, just because you help make a child doesn't mean you're, you did the work of a father. Mm -hmm. Father is, is, fatherhood is a verb, um, as in life is a verb. These character choices we make, uh, choices we make every day are, are, you know, compounded assets for our future or not. Um, I am, I have been blessed with that long view of, of life of realizing early on that in investments in ourselves today can tee up ROI and our future can buy us green lights in our future. The choices we make today are compounding assets of our future and can tee us up mm. uh, uh, for success. Uh, that's hence the title of the book, Green Lights. I know yeah. I know for a fact we can engineer green lights in our life. I also know for a fact that I've been damn fortunate and had some just fall on my lap. But choices of character are long-term choices that mm. deal with delayed gratification. Mm. Yeah, I remember something that Dan told me a while back, which was when he was when he was early in his career, and thinking about what he wanted to do and who he wanted to be, he was spending time working for George Plimpton at the Paris Review, yep. and he would go to these fancy, you know, Upper East Side uh, parties with all these mucky mucks. And George, although he was respected, wasn't necessarily a man of means, but he had made this decision to live this life of adventure. And when they would go to these parties, all these people would gravitate around George because he was the one with the stories. And that's what made Dan inspired to live the kind of amazing life of adventure that, that he's lived. And I see a lot of that in you. I mean, we're gonna talk about the book, but these pivots that you've made, the wanderlust that kind of infuses your life and these moments where, you know, by dint of a wet dream or some kind of epiphany that you would have or being stuck, you would always know this is the time where I need to kind of um, do my walkabout. So I'm yeah. interested in, in how that kind of plays into the fabric of, of your life and how you prioritize yeah. it. Well, look, I think, you know, those hints, angels of truth are around us all the time. It's just, we don't always notice them, you know, they're there, but we don't notice them. And it's understandable. Got a high frequency life, man. A lot of noise coming in on all of us. Mm -hmm. So I have learned early on to listen to that spider sense in me that says, you need to go get away, McConaughey. You need to go spend some time with yourself. Open up the auto bond between your head and your heart. Because right now it's a bit of a one-way gravel, <laughs> you know, uh, dirt road for you. And, you know, your heart and your, your heart and your mind aren't really uh in sync, as much in sync as they should be. And then questioning what matters. I've always questioned since I was 14. It's one of the things with writing the book, my diary entries when I was 14 were about the similar or about similar topics that I'm still interested in today at 50. I've had a pretty good threshold for when I do get that spider sense to say, oh, you need to get out of here, McConaughey. You need to leave what you're in so you can get outside and have a clearer view. You need to leave where you are right now and find out what do I, what do I find out when I go away? Uh, memory catches up. Oh, demarcations between events that maybe I was handling and I'm good at handling events, uh, just being, being in the middle of it going press, you know, let's do this pilot on me. I'll be a horse. I'll get through it. But I didn't notice what had happened to me. Like, for instance, when I got famous, I didn't notice what that was until I got the hell out of Dodge and went on a 22 day walk about with myself in Peru. Then I was like, Oh, that's what happened. Oh, that's what that event or circumstance or run in with that person was about because they were all on top of each other at the time. I wasn't able to separate things that were going on too much frequency. Um, so I've have gone away many times on my own. 
Um, I've learned to enjoy the solitude, not necessarily enjoy my company in the solitude, which usually the first 12 days, I do not enjoy my company. Mm. Um, I'm shaking demons off my back, feeling regret, lost, confused, trying to figure stuff out. And usually around day 12 or day 13, I'll have a breakthrough. Um, and it's usually, it's that breakthrough where, all right, come on, hey, since you're the only guy I'm stuck with and I can't get rid of, which is each of us for ourselves, what are we going to forgive and what are we going to say I'm not, not putting up with anymore? <laughs> Figure those two out, shake hands with myself and wake up the next morning. And then those trips are wonderful. Then I'm present. Then I'm singing a song. Then wisdom's landing on me. Then I'm hearing those angels and those butterflies of truth that land and you go, bam, this is on me. I'm hearing it. Now, how do I personalize it, this mm -hmm. truth, and, and ask myself and answer the question why it's coming to me? How do I preserve it, have the patience to preserve it? And then when I leave those trips, the big fun challenge is how do I take that truth, the solitary truth, back into the masses, back into the stadium of life and ride that bull, that rodeo of life and remember trust that this truth that crossed me that found me while i was in solitude is true now then and forever wherever i am right that's the hard part. it's it it strikes me as almost this uh impulse for self-preservation or self-defense like there's it takes a certain level of awareness as an individual to recognize those moments even if they're visited upon all of us and you're somebody you know the fact that you've been journaling consistently from you know way back from an early age tells me that you're an introspective person by nature. I'm not sure where that came from. Maybe you have an answer to that. But then you go on these adventures that are about self-defense, self-preservation, reinvention, reflection. And then the trick, the hard part is bringing it back and not letting it evaporate. But, but taking, you know, having, being able to distill whatever wisdom comes to you about the experience itself, but more importantly, what you learn about your own self and then trying to exude that, to imbue it and live your life in, according, in, in accordance. Yes, and, and you're right. The, the initial reaction to leave and go into solitude is a defense mechanism, is a survival mechanism, is a, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm not feeling grounded here. Uh, mentally, spiritually. Uh, so I need to, I don't know what the answer is, but I just know I got to get out of here where I can hear myself think. I know I got to get out of here where I can be in a place where I can receive some of the truth. Um, then, yeah, that fun challenge of bringing it back and yes, not let it be stripped away, which it eventually does and it gets stripped away, but to even better sometimes bring it back and play offense with it. Like go, I'm not just coming back going, can I hold on to it? I want to put it into action. Uh, I want to, I want to, you know, it's why I'm such a slow reader. If I read, you know, one of my favorite writings is Emerson's essay on self-reliance. Mm. Well, I mean, that take that, 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 that essay, which is about 20 pages long, took me two years to read <laughs> because so good, though. the first paragraph I'm like, Whoa, I got to take that and see if I can apply that in life and see what the reverb of life is back to me. If I'm looking through that lens, which takes me a couple of months before I can come back and read the next paragraph. Hmm. That's the fun stuff I like to read or the fun things that wisdom will come to me in solitude that I want to take back into society. And you're right it strips away. You look up and you go, oh, I'm falling back into some old habits. I forgot that. I got to go calibrate. I got to go back to school. I got to go break a sweat. I need to go away again. I need to go revisit my diary and look at what I was doing when I was satisfied, when I was successful, when I was happy with myself, my relationships were good, when I did have that auto bond between the mind and the heart. And because I'm in a rut again, so I need to go back. And I found clues in my diaries of when I was happy as to what I was doing. Oh, who was I hanging out with? What was I drinking? Where was I going? How much sleep was I getting? Oh, I see. Now in my life, I'm in this bit of a rut. I'm complacent with some of those things. I'm doing some things that are, that are not feeding myself. And so I need to go back. So some of those diaries have been good little maps for me mm. to go back and dissect when I felt successful and happy rather than just go dissect failures, which is more of our our habits, I think. Do you find it more difficult to pull the trigger or pull the ripcord and, 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 you know, split when things are going well or when things are challenging? Like as you progress through life and you have more responsibilities and more abundance in your life, 
it's got to be harder to say I'm gonna I'm gonna walk away from this and go try something else. It's it's different when you're all of whatever you were 23, 24, and you were yeah. living in an airstream. Yeah, and having three children and, yeah. and a life and a family makes that a little harder too. Um, but yeah, more difficult when things are going well because I don't know about you, but me when things are going well, I inevitably feel like oh well, this is the mean. This is how it's supposed to be. This is how it is. I've got it figured out. This way, I, there's no reason for it ever to dip below this, which of course it always does. Um, and then I got to go off again. But I have, uh, you know, part of the inspiration for going away to go write this book was a bit, was, was that. I needed a trip away. And not only did I, my wife knew I needed it. Yeah. She gave me a kick in the backside and she'll come to me and tell me, you need to get out of here for a while. Go off, you know, go off. Don't come. And, and then I'll call, you know, and she'll like, don't even call. <laughs> well, of course. What's that mean? Of course I'm calling now, yeah. right? <laughs> Much quicker than if she just said, make sure you call. Yeah. Because I don't like to be told what, what to do. Um, but I'll go away and like with this, she goes, don't come back till you got something. However long that takes, we're good. I got the mm. kiddos here to go. It was a gift she gave me. Um, I was able to go away on these walkabouts without having to look over my shoulder and go, oh, am I building a debit right now? Because when I go back, am I going to have to do a whole lot of extra work to catch back up for what I missed? She's never been... Uh, someone who made me feel like, okay, well, now you've been away. Now you need to double up on all your duties. It was always like she she pushes me out the door, mm. and she did with this book. That's uh, that's amazing. You definitely married the right one for that. Yeah. Well, the this as the story goes, uh, and I don't know how much of this is apocryphal versus true. You you took off with your journals. You went to the desert for something like fifty two days. Mm. I read somewhere that that uh, you did it without electricity. But then in the book, you at the end of the book, you kind of, you were in a, a couple different places, right? Like I'm envisioning you with a typewriter. Like if you don't have electricity, how are you writing this book? Well, I started off with that electricity. The first 12 days were with that electricity. Um, and I took a generator so I could plug uh, in my, okay. my laptop. Um, and that was just, you know, I wanted to go someplace where I didn't, I, I, email, I shut down my account. I want to go someplace with no phone signal to where only, you know, 6 p.m. each night, I, there was a certain hill about a half a mile away that I would hike to the top and make the call to check on the family. And that was it. Other than that, no incoming calls, no incoming emails, no outgoing. I needed to be stripped out of the necessities to go say, how can I best go have solitude with me and me of my last 50 years um, without any outside uh, um, invitations? And so that was the first 12 days. And I must say, I went into it, it was intimidating number one to go. I thought looking back at 50 years of my life, I was gonna be embarrassed. I thought there were things, I knew there were things I was gonna be shamed about. Um, there were places I was gonna go, you arrogant little prick, what were you thinking? Um, and what happened is most of the things that I thought I would be embarrassed about, I ended up laughing at. Most of the things I thought I'd be ashamed about, I'd ended up forgiving myself for, or noticed I already had forgiven myself for. And the parts where I was arrogant, I laughed at, but was also like, well, good on you for thinking you knew it all at that point. Mm. Because following those points in my diaries where I would be so self-confident and all-knowing, I always very soon stepped in shit in my life, <laughs> going based off like I am, I, I absolutely know. And I was happy that at least I had the confidence to think I had it all figured out. And then as life dealt me cards, found out I didn't. Um, I went away thinking that these diaries are going to be much more academic. And I remember the first four days sort of trying to force it into an academia mind. And all of a sudden I stopped. And I remember I stopped one night. I said, look, look, all right. You haven't even looked at these things. Just read each page and see what it is. See what it lends itself to be. And let's just stack up. See if some categories show up. And what happened after about 10 days was I had these seven stacks. It was a stack full of stories. It was a stack full of people, a stack full of places, a stack full of prescribes, a stack full of poems, prayers, and a whole bunch of bumper stickers. Mm. So those were my categories. And then I said, okay, we have some semblance here, some structure of something. Now, what is all this? And that was actually that what I just riffed off was my original title. Mm. Stories, people, places, prescribes, poems, prayers, and a whole bunch of bumper stickers. Yeah. Not a bad title, but... <laughs> I then said, now let's read through all these and see if something, another central theme or a column reveals itself. And that's where the title Green Lights came from. Mm. Uh, 
I noticed uh, that there were successes in my life that I engineered. I noticed there were successes that I got just plain good fortune and landed in my lap. I noticed that uh, in certain ways, red and yellow lights in my life, crises and hardships, I immediately, I believed while I was in them that there was a lesson to be learned and a green light asset within them, not knowing when I would, it would be revealed to me, but trusting just to stick with it, stick with the hardship, endure it. And there's a, there's a, there's a green light in it. I noticed that some things that I thought like my father passing, how can that be a green light? That's an absolute red light. Well, I keep reading my diaries 10 years later, I'm understanding how the values and incentive that he taught me, I wouldn't have enacted them in my own life if he'd have still been alive because I would have relied on him being there to have my back. So his passing away actually gave me a kick in the backside to look the world in the eye and have more courage to go chase down who I wanted to be and be myself. Mm. So the, some, of the, some of the hardships that I had revealed green lights. Some of the hardships I've had, I suppose, have not re revealed their green lights yet and may not reveal themselves. To, they may only reveal themselves to my great grandkids. I don't know. But eventually, the theme of the book is that all the red and yellows do eventually turn green, and I believe that. Yeah, so the narrative always comes back to this idea of green lights. And I mean, first of all, I should say, like, I, I finished the book this morning. I, I, I loved it. To echo what our other mutual friend, Ryan Holiday, said, I think he said something like, I knew it was going to be a good book. I didn't know it was going to be this good. Like, you did an amazing job with this book. It, it has this really... Um, you know, very McConaughey-esque touch to it. Like it's it's your book through and through. But it also reminded me of kind of the beat poets. It has that type of aesthetic. And it's this kind of patchwork of, you know, stories from your life in a relatively traditional kind of memoir narrative, but interspersed with your poetry and always with these kind of life lessons and takeaways that are just unbelievably wise. And I would look at these and I, I would wonder like, how old was he when he wrote this stuff? I mean, when you went back and looked at your journals, were you surprised at the wisdom of some of the things that you said when you were younger? Was there anything that stuck out that you didn't expect? Um, obviously the earlier diary entries were why's, why, what, where, when, how's. It was the questions. There was a question mark after everything. So I was always seeking the questions. As I evolved and got older, I started to answer some of those questions and could sum them up in a, in a, in a wisdom bomb or an aphorism or a bumper sticker, right? But it didn't lead to any fewer questions. <laughs> yeah. My questions evolved, I think. But uh, as I said earlier, what I was looking at, what I was at, the questions I was asking at 14, about existence and who am I and what's what matters and what's life about, um, how the world works, who am I in this world? I still question those. But to interrupt you quickly there, it, it is unusual for a 14 year old to be asking those kinds of questions. So I'm curious, they, like, where do you think that comes from in you? I don't know, you know, I don't know how to answer that because we weren't raised as a very introspective family. We always have our prayer and gratitude as a family, we were raised as consistent extroverts. I mean, like I wasn't allowed to watch TV or read because my mom would say, why read about or watch somebody do something that you can go do yourself? Get outside. Uh -huh. There's always go, go to do it, go experience it. So, you know, I, I don't know where my, my, my family, my mom wasn't really a writer. My dad wasn't. Um, I mean, I was always though early on, the inquisitor of the family, the interrogator, the one who wasn't satisfied with mom and dad just going, because we said so. I would go, well, let's get underneath this. That's why I was going to be a lawyer. I was, they were like, huh, dude, you, Matthew, the youngest one, you debate things and question things to the nth degree and it's exhausting at times. So I was always sort of wanting to get to the underbelly of the meaning of things mm. um, at a very early age. So I don't know where that came from, but that's just kind of, I think always been who I am. Mm. Yeah, in reading about growing up with your dad, I mean, I, I just, I was thinking most people who have had an experience like that would be, you know, doing a lot of therapy and harboring a lot of resentments, but you really have a lot of peace around it and a lot of love. A lot of honor and a lot of love. That's the word. You know, I, I um, if you look at the stories, they open up with a wild story about a, a monumental fight that my mom and dad had, which got bloody. 
but ended up with him making love on the floor. Uh-huh. I always, when people ask me about the love of my family or the love that I have, my parents had for me and that my mom and dad had for each other, I always have told these stories of discipline that also that involve some form of violence or corporal punishment. And I'm on this book tour, I've been wondering why, because when I tell you the story, you see me light up and people go like, on paper, I've got my hand over my mouth going, oh my gosh, call child protection services. Right. And yes, Matthew McConaughey, you must've been in therapy since then to deal with this trauma. And I'm like, no. So when I tell the story though, people get very, you see the humanity and the love that I have for them. And I think the reason I tell those stories is because they were the biggest test to defeat the bubble of love that we were surrounded with, but they never had a chance of beating it. And so I tell those stories because there's like a lightning rod of like, oh, this is trauma. Oh, this is violent. Oh, this is problem. Oh, this is where it all falls apart. But it actually never had a chance mm. of falling apart. I mean, my mom and dad divorced twice, married three times. The two divorces are that lightning rod trying to puncture that bubble of love. Ended in three marriages, got married right. more than they got divorced. <laughs> Us getting punished. I earned every time, everything I got punished for. And I look back and I go, well, you got your first butt whooping for not answering to your name. Your second for saying, I can't. Your third for saying, I hate you to your brother. And your fourth for lying. Well, if I'm going to go back and do the math. That's four pretty doggone good reasons to get your butt whooped. Always answer to your name. Know you're having trouble doing something instead of that you can't do it. Mm. Don't hate and don't lie. I mean, I'm like, there were values instilled in those. And every time I did it, I remember not the butt whooping, but the value that I don't say that word, C-A-N-T. You know, I don't, I yeah. don't hate. Um, I do go, no, it's not Matt, it's Matthew. You know, I do my best to tell the truth and not lie. You know, so those are good. Those were good lessons that were ingrained in us. And I think that's why I tell those as love stories, even though, like I say, on paper, you agree or disagree with the form of punishment. That's what was, what was being instilled in me. And that's mm. what I took from it. Even then, you know, when my mom taught me to swim and threw me in the river and here we come on a waterfall that if I go off that, I'm not going to die, but I'm going to, I'm going to break a bone or two. And she walks along the bank with her arms crossed going, yeah. swim, swim, <laughs> swim. When I, finally put my head down and saw that waterfall coming and swam to the bank. I was scared, but I wasn't mad. I was immediately proud right. and, and like, you know, in shock, but I was immediately proud of it. Cause I was like, mom was right. She was right. It was time for me to, learn how to swim. Yeah. There's, there's so many lessons in that. It's an extreme example of something that I think has been eroded in our culture in this time of, you know, participation trophies where, you know, we're coddling our kids to such an extent that we're depriving them of, you know, some of those rough and tumble moments where they get their knees skinned so that they can learn these lessons. You know, I don't know yeah. about the extreme of your, your examples, but at least letting kids fail and fall and get into trouble and figure out, you know, where their compass lies. Let them go negotiate. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think in some, some ways we, we, we can and do deprive our children of understanding how to go negotiate a situation. I, I, I've been looking at it like this. It's like a, a tree limb. A child's not afraid of heights until they fall. Well, before they've fallen, it's like, all right, see them on that tree and you go, well, if they fell from there, I mean, it's going to hurt, but I'm not going to, you know, have to go to the hospital. I think I'll let them keep climbing there. Uh -huh. You know, let them go negotiate that. And maybe they make it or maybe they fall. Well, then it gets up higher and there's certain things we go, I mean, if they fell from there, this could be really, really painful. I think now's the time to go, hey, right. <laughs> hey, buddy, come on down a little bit. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? It's like, what level limb do we let them go out? And then we should, I think a lot of society, raise the level of that limb a little bit to let our kids go, yeah, you're going to get bumped and bruised there, buddy. You're going to skin the knees. Go ahead and wear those knees out in your jeans and or fall from that limb and go, yep, you see, that happens Yeah. if, if you don't pay attention. So, I, I, yeah, I would say I'm not you know, I don't think we should say the, the, the level of the, the, the height of the limb that my parents right. sort of proverbial let us walk out on needs to be the meme for everybody. But there was great value in those, in those lessons. And we never were abused. We never were injured. It hurt. Blood was drawn, but we were never injured. 
there's a difference between hurt and injury. And we were never, you know, so, and we were never abused. And again, the love was never in question. And being reared in the kind of shadow of this outlaw logic, there was a fair amount of acting out on your part, but it was kind of healthy teenager stuff. Like you weren't taking it to, you know, to such an extent that you were getting into big time trouble. No, I, number one, I was pretty good with getting away with stuff because I had two older brothers who, as they say, paved a wide highway uh -huh. for me. Um, and, you know, my brothers would jack with me because they were like, you little mama's boy, the golden boy. And then I remind them, well, I got away with stuff better than y'all did too because uh -huh. I learned that. At the same time, I was, you know, a bit of a hellraiser, but it was all sort of good. What it wasn't, it wasn't too gnarly a stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I, I never really got into drugs. I didn't harm other people. I got away with some things that, you know, wouldn't be prescriptive for everyone to get away with. But I also say this, and someone asked me the other day, do you believe, uh, you know, you were, you were raised, as I see in the book, Matthew, with a certain amount of fear of your father and mother. You still believe in the value of that. And my answer is, yeah. So how do you translate that as a parent to three kids now? Yeah, well, differently than my mom and dad did. <laughs> yeah, um, I would think so. Just because I don't choose to, and I'm not judging how they did it. Um, again, yeah, I write about this in the book. My parents also, their reasoning, trust me, I went to them before and said, would you please ground me? And they were like, no. I go, why? And I go, because that would be taking your time away from you. And your time is valuable. And I've been to over, we're going to get this over with, and then it's over. Mm. Glad that happened that way. That's not how I choose to raise my children right now. Um, I'm trying to, Camille and I are trying to teach our kids values. We do talk, we do not say, because I said so as much as my parents did, or most of our parents probably did. We do try to explain things. We try to, uh, um, you know, we had an instance the other night, you know, the youngest one was, was, was getting sleepy and popped off and, and, you know, disrespected his mother just by like walking away from the middle of the thing. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Now look, I'm tired. Camilla's tired. It's a late night. We've been out all day with the kids. What do you want to do? You kind of want to let it slide and just go to bed and let them go to sleep. Mm. Like, no, no, we're building a debit. We've got to gather up the energy and sit down with our son and go, do you understand why that's not allowable? This is your mother. All right. She works her butt off. We work our butt off to give you a house, to give you a meal, to raise you and nudge you to be the young man that you can be. And you have to have respect and what you just did was disrespectful. And if you're disrespecting her, you're disrespecting yourself. And you do not have the right to talk to your mother like that. It's a hell of a lot easier for your mom and I to let it slide and just let you go to bed with that punk move you just pulled. But we're gonna stay up and we're gonna handle this right now until you understand why that's disrespectful and why it's mean and why it's ugly and why you're out of line. And why if you continue to do that, you, the days will just not be as fun mm. for you. Um, and it took a while because I was a very stubborn son that I was talking to. It went on for over an hour and a half and finally he understood it. And the fact that we gave that amount of time to say, no, you're not going to bed yet. No, we're not going to bed until you get it. I mean, yeah, just sitting there spending the time and your child going like, geez, mom and dad are still here an hour and a half later right. and they're not letting me off the hook. Okay. I get it. So, and then, you know, the challenge becomes, how do you have them? How can they remember that? So they don't become repeat offenders so quick you know, right after. Yeah, he'll remember that. And I think, you know, what you said earlier about asking your mom to please ground you, like the child wants those boundaries and they know that you're coming to them from a place of love, even if it's hard and concerning. Well, on, on the fear thing again, I know that there's a lot of things. I was faced with temptation to a lot of things grow up, growing up that I knew I shouldn't do, that I did not do for fear of the consequences. So fear definitely kept me from doing things because I'm like, I measured it, wait a minute. If we go egg that car and do that, and man, pop, find out about that, oh my gosh, that's gonna be hell to pay. <laughs> no, risk reward, I'm out. You know, there's just certain things I said, it's not, it's not worth it. And I had certain friends that didn't have the consequences to deal with that I would have had to deal with that did go do it and got away with all kinds of stuff and some of them did never really uh, uh kind of, some of them turned out to be you know uh crappy dudes <laughs> but there was also like your it was almost like your dad wanted you to do some of these things as long as you told him the truth it, it wasn't the offense that offended him it was you lying about it like as long as That's you were it. honest 
with him and you got away with it, it was almost an attaboy from him. In a way. And that was part of the initiation of mandate. He wouldn't let us know that, what you just said, but that is what he was looking for. So there's a story in there about me stealing a pizza one night with, but with a buddy of mine, Bud Fjonker. And the, I, I got home, my dad's on the phone with Mr. Felker, the father of the guy that I was out with and we'd stole the pizza, we walked out on the pizza from Pizza Hut. And you know, you, you get older, you come home and you've stolen a pizza and your dad goes, did you pay for that pizza? You should know right now that he knows you didn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? yeah. <laughs> but of course at that age, I'm like, well, no, I mean, I think so, dad. I mean, we, 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 well, the girl had recognized Bud, called his dad and said, hey, it was my table. They walked out on the pizza and my dad was just looking for me to go. Yeah, we stole the pizza and he'd have gone, gosh, damn me, son. I've stolen a lot of pizzas in my life. Listen, next time, get away with it better. But thank you for telling me <laughs> yeah. that you did. Now, gosh, damn it. Get your ass in bed. Right. Watch it. Well, I didn't. I groveled. I defended myself. I tried to weasel my way out of it. He gave me three, four chances to tell him. Yes. And I dug myself such a hole that I'm shivering there with the damn pee spot in my jeans and fright, not at, from him, but at my own cowardice. Right. And I remember I finally asked, gave me one last chance, just tell me, did you know you were gonna steal that pizza? And I went, well, no sir. And he reached up and he backhanded me. And I crumbled to the floor in the corner, not from the backhand, but because my lactic acid coward hypocritical legs were numb under me from being such a weasel and not being able to just admit, yes, I did. And that's what broke his heart. And I was scared because I saw I was breaking my dad's heart right in front of me because all he wanted me to do is what you said, just tell me, son, just tell me the truth. Don't lie to me about stealing a damn pizza, man. It's not about the stealing the pizza. It's about owning up to what you did and telling your father the truth. And that I remember. The tears on my face were seeing my dad heartbroken, heartbroken and knowing that I let him down. Well, it's just one of many rites of passage that he puts you through. And the, the book is, you know, makes it very clear how important these rites of passage are in your, you know, evolution as a human being. So much so that it seems to me that these um, walkabout adventures that you go on later are your way of creating additional rites of passage when, when you know, we live in a culture where we're bereft of those. Like most people don't grow up with any kind of meaningful rites of passage. And that's something that we're hardwired to need. We have to test ourselves or we need to be tested by somebody else. And if we're not getting that, we have to put ourselves in that position. Yes, need resistance to find structure, to create form. And, you know, for me later in life, I get successful. I'm famous, you know, too many options can make a tyrant of any of us. Mm. And when the world's saying yes, well, that's where the devil lives and all the yeses, not the noes. And I needed to go, wait a minute, is this what really matters? I have that line in the book, but when you can ask yourself if you want to before you do. Well, when you're getting all these things for the first time in your life and every, the world's a big green light and everything's yes, I wanted to go away and see, wait a minute, are these green lights that are plugged into a battery or are they eternal, you know, solar powered green lights? Mm. Well, I'm getting a lot of them that I was like, oh, these are all kind of plugged into a battery. They're, they're impermanent. They're just kind of for now. They're, they're, they're kind of a fad. They're not really thinking, they're stops, not stays. And so I need to go away, create that resistance, put myself into discomfort, go without things sort of fast, um, from not just food or drink, but fast from attention, fast from fame, fast from uh, all the yeses that are coming to, to me in the world and get some discernment again. As I said earlier, let my memory catch up. Who the heck am I? What really mm. matters? What do I give a damn about? What was that moment? Was that a real moment or was that just part of the, was I just part of the machine, you know? And so to disseminate and, have, and, and, and discriminate and make some choices for myself again. That's why I, I needed those walkabouts and still do. Right. I mean, when you're, you talk about you're kind of hitting your stride, you're making bank, you're in all these movies, you move into the chateau, you're wearing leather pants, you're hitting the clubs. The it's, all, it's all happening. I mean, most people would just ride that out and just more, more, more. When am I going to get the house up in the hills? And just continue to double down for as long as you know the industry would allow them to do so. 
Until you're 27 years old, that seems to be the going age of all the uh, the great rock and rollers. They make yeah. it to 27 and then right. they go. Yeah, and they all all at the chateau too. <laughs> yeah. God bless the chateau, boy. They they promote a little bit of mischief. Mm. Thank goodness. And I gave myself some license there. I said, you know what? I'm going to test this out. I'm going to test out my threshold of hedonism. I'm going to. I don't want to be harmful. I don't want to be mean. I don't. I don't want to be, uh, uh, um, you know, mean to anyone else or myself. At the same time, I'm going to give myself a, a Saturday night POV for 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 some time. And I did it for a couple of years, um, and then I just noticed that okay, this feels revolutionary, not evolutionary. This feels like a stop, not a stay. This indulgence, an option to indulge is not, I'm not really feeling an ascension in my life. I'm cool with where it is. I'm not griping about it. I'm enjoying it and I'd be silly if I didn't, but I'm not really feeling a build, an ascension in my life. And I want to feel build. Um, so I decided to get out of there and go away. So I knew at that time at the end, it was a, that that was a stop and not a stay. I also, you know, during that time, at the end of that time, really started to question my belief in, in, in God and stuff. And so I remember saying, you know, okay, you're a believer, but why? And is your belief, is your sense of belief, Matthew, your fatalistic sense of belief that it's all fate? Is it, is, is that it? Are you using that as an excuse almost in ways in your life to let yourself off the hook? And I remember going, well, let's just put two hands on the wheel of self-determination here. And let's be our own judge and jury, Matthew, and let's call it out and not rely on, hey, no, you know what, if, uh, you know, it's all been written. And so I went through a very, I would call it an agnostic time. And as I said in the book, it wasn't as much of a time where I disbelieved God. It was a time where I said, you need to hold yourself more accountable, Matthew. You need to have both hands on your wheel of where you're going because you're letting yourself slide on just about on a lot of stuff. And I want to go test that out. I want to hold you. I want to hold you more accountable, Matthew. So I wanted to hold myself more accountable, and um, went through a couple of years of that. And it was a very good exercise. And my relationship with God, I believe, I, I, my belief is that God was smiling, and going, "Yeah, good on you, good on you." <laughs> Way to grab a hold of the wheel because I did. Because yeah, you do have free will, and 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 I don't. I'm, I, and it didn't make me think that anything's going to change after this life, but it did make me say, "Hey, while I'm in it." remember that I've got freedom of choice and right. hold myself more responsible for my choices. Well, let's let's dig a little bit deeper into the the faith conversation um, because I think that 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 green lights really is a spiritual book. I mean, just on the subject of green lights itself, there's this idea that you can catch them by virtue of skill, intent, endurance, resilience, discipline, hard work, all of these things. But the flip side of that coin is this idea that you talked about earlier, like engineering them. And that's about frequency. That's about intuition, fate, like you just said. It's about finding your way into the zone. And it's about how you comport yourself in the world so you become a magnet for good things as opposed to somebody who's chasing them. Yeah. Um Look, I say in the in the book, I, I'm pretty sure the world's con at times. I'm pretty sure the world's conspiring to make me happy. Uh, and then what I mean by that is, someone asked me this the other day. What do you what do you your measures of trust? Where do they come from, and how do you and how do you have that with people? Here, and my answer, which I'd never answered before until I was asked, that was, I come into this conversation just meeting you, and you have 100 percent of my trust until. You disprove me until you give me reason to distrust. I give everybody, I have a uh, utmost respect and reverence for, for people and believe in the goodness of people and that no one's out to try and harm me. Now, I'm not foolish. My eyes are open. I could listen to your questions and maybe I hear you going, oh, I think Rich is trying to weasel in here and trying to do something that's not really true. But until then, I'm going, no, 100%, 100% trust until you prove me other, until you prove it otherwise. Um, I have learned and do believe in this relationship, responsibility and freedom, the responsibility of freedom and the freedom and responsibility that the choices we make today, that compound assets in our future, they, 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 you can tee yourself up for more green lights with the choices we make today. Meaning if I don't like cheat and steal, 
if I choose not to. Now, I think it's a very selfish act not to like cheating still. And someone will go, wait a minute. It's a selfish act to like cheating still because you get what you want right now. Yeah. Is that really selfish though? I don't think so because if you do that, for the rest of your life, everywhere you go, you got to look over your shoulder to make sure no one's there in the room that you like cheating and stole from. So when you're looking over your shoulder, you're not spending your time, you're spending their time and you're not present. So you're stressed. So you really didn't, you really wasn't a selfish act. You bought debits and yellow lights in your future, not the freedom of green lights. I'm trying to live a life where I don't leave crumbs and don't have to look over my shoulder. I don't owe anybody money. Mm. You know, I don't, I, 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 I haven't been perfect, but for what I've screwed up on, I hopefully I've gone and apologized and made amends and probably still have more to make that I don't know. But I'm trying to make choices to where each, I'm teeing myself up for tomorrow morning. At the very basic level, here's a, here's a basic green light. <laughs> put coffee in your coffee filter the night before. So when you get up the next tomorrow morning groggy, all you got to do is push the damn button. Because mm. it's hard to make your coffee when you hadn't had your coffee sometimes. And when you don't put the coffee in the filter, you get up the next morning like, why didn't I team myself up for this? Why wouldn't I kind to my future self here? Well, there's choices we make every day to be kind and cool to our future selves. And the honey hole of those choices, I think, which is what I'm chasing, is where are the, where do, can we make the choices where what we want is actually what we need and what we need is actually what we want. Mm. That seems to be the honey hole of heaven uh, on earth right there, where what's good for us selfishly is also what's good for the most amount of people. That's the, that's where it's re- That's the ultimate spot. I believe right. that I haven't got to, but I'm still chasing. It's not dissimilar from 12 steps. I'm, I'm in recovery for a long time. And, and so much of the steps are about like putting through, putting a person through a program that allows them to, you know, make amends for their past behavior, uh, redress their character defects, so that you can emerge and navigate the world, looking people in the eye, telling the truth, not being afraid of what's, you know, your wife's going to find in your jeans pockets when she's doing the laundry, or you know, just being yeah. able to like live um, congruent, like where your actions are in alignment with your values, and you don't have to look over you know, your shoulder or worry about like when that lie is going to catch up to you. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. I've never, never been in or don't really know the 12 steps. I've known some people that are in them and really enjoy the conversations where we found a synonymous sort of approach and view on things. Um, look, man, I, it's hard to remember a lie. It is, it is, it's work, man. And it's not fun work to try and make up and go to every situation going, oh, wait a minute, who all's involved? Is there anyone I screwed over here? What's the situation? Jeez, oh man, it's stressful. Yeah. And, and me, I'm a fan of stress. And people that go no stress, I'm like, what are you talking about? But You're the, alive. It's a toxic stress that you carry it's around. It's a toxic stress, yeah. yeah. It's not the right kind. Life's hard enough with that creating mm. extra work for ourselves that's not constructive. If we're just running around trying to play defense, to cover up our past mistakes, we're busting our ass dealing with stuff and something that's not constructive or affirmatively moving forward. We're going to run into enough hill, uh, uphill battles without having to deal with, mm-hmm. you know, sins of our past or, or, or things or, or, or contracts we broke in our past. Man, try not to gather up too many of them and you've got more energy to handle the ones that you, the, the, the real battles that are in front of us anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the other idea that you keep circling back to in the book is this idea of relativity. And I'm not mm-hmm. sure I totally grasp where you're coming from with that, but it keeps okay. it keeps coming up in bold typeface throughout the book. Yes. So the tool theory that's come to me is this, when faced with the inevitable, get relative. Now, when do we deem a situation inevitable? That's already a relative question. Let's take COVID right now. Inevitable, it's here. Don't deny it. Don't sit here every day getting all excited about maybe tomorrow it's gone because it won't be gone tomorrow. So how do I get relative with this? Okay. Well, for me, instant, for instance, uh, um, you know, you can persist through a situation, you can pivot, or you can raise the white flag and say, I give to fight another day. Well, we're in COVID. So let's not raise the flag and say, we're going to fight another day because we're all in it. Now, can I persist through this, doing, living and expecting everything that I was before COVID? Yeah, I could do that, but I don't see the, the, uh, the net gain in that because I think it's going to be around here for a while. So I got to pivot. 
All right. So what I mean by pivot, get relative with this situation, the inevitable COVID that we're in. All right. I'm forced to be at home more. I'm quarantining. Don't like that. I don't like that. But all right, let me start looking at the upside here. Uh, I'm doing some more inventory on myself. I'm spending more time with my kids. I'm cooking more with my family in the kitchen. I got my mom with this. So the kids are around their grandmother more than they ever were. And she's 88. So that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe spend some more time writing right now. Um, I'm starting to try to find the assets, the green lights in this red light that we're in. That's how I'm choosing to get relative with it. That's a choice that we can make with every situation once we deem it inevitable. Now, if we endure... If you, if, you, if you deem an outcome of something you want, if you say, well, it's, in, it's inevitable, I, I, I can't get it. If you say that too soon, we're a quitter. But if you say it too late, we're acting out the definition of insanity, trying to bang our head on while trying to get a different outcome by doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. So we have to measure those things for ourselves. When do we deem a situation inevitable, an outcome inevitable? for us or, or by getting it or not getting it. And then how do we get relative with it? Sometimes I need to back off being so persistent and resilient and say, I have to reapproach this the way I'm looking at this. I got to dance up in a different step. I got to throw myself off balance and reapproach this circumstance in my life. This question, this crossroads. Um, there's, that's, a, that's an art there that we're all trying to, I think, work out is when to deem something inevitable. And then once we do, how do we get relative with it? Mm. Um, is, that, is that still confusing? <laughs> no, I got it. I mean, it, it reminds me of of the serenity prayer, which is sort of, Very much. You, know, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the, the wisdom to know the difference. Like, it kind of boils down to that. But yep. I'm wondering, like, does this come, is this a muscle that you flexed for so long that it comes naturally to you? Or is there like a daily practice is gratitude a reflex or is that something that you have to cultivate for yourself? Good question. Um, look, I didn't come, you know, it was going back and looking at the 50 years of my life and the 36 years of diaries that revealed that understanding when faced with the inevitable get relative. It wasn't something that I'd written down or thought over and opined over in the past and then tried to practice. Um, Look, as far as gratitude, I will, you know, I was raised on, you know, if you come into breakfast in a bad mood, mom said, get your ass back in your bedroom and don't come out here till you see the rose in the vase and set the dust on the table. It was, I was raised on, <laughs> oh, you're griping about not having any yeah. shoes. Is that right? Oh, yeah? You think you got it so bad? Well, let me introduce you to the kid with no feet. Whoa, shit. Okay. Uh, talk about relativity. Um, we were raised on being thankful that the sun came up another day and that better be enough for you to be happy today. That better be enough for you to stand tall because that wasn't a guarantee. So what are you going to do with it? We were raised on drop down to rock bottom and be thankful for things that we take for granted every day. Mm. So has that triggered me through life to maybe see and be, have thanks for certain things that maybe I should just expect? Sure. Probably. Um, At the same time, you know, uh, I've got a pretty, I've had a pretty good threshold for taking the context of a situation pretty early in, in the circumstance and going, all right, what's my risk reward here? How do I get what I want here? And is what I want really what I need? All right. What's the long-term long money ROI on the choice I make here? Am I doing something, uh, being eccentric for eccentricity's sake? Ooh, yeah. Well, there's nothing really constructive about that. That's kind of not worth shit. That's a fad. Uh, that's not going to last. What's a lasting choice that I can make here that's going to be good for me and good for the whole situation uh, that I can sleep well with? It's not going to wake me up in the middle of the night going, oh, why'd you do that? Mm. Or I'm not going to wake up tomorrow morning and go regret it or think it was a one-off flash in the pan. Trying to make choices that are going to have long money, um, ones that are going to last, one that are going to uh, going to um, feed my good wolf instead of my bad wolf. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so a lot of it, I think, has been instinct. And then I'm just now trying to put it into words and to a theory that I can go, oh, remember that. You can apply that tool. Mm. Is that situation inevitable? When do you deem it such? And how do you get relative with it? So it was a way of just almost academically intellectualizing something that maybe has been an instinct for me that I noticed in looking at my diaries and how I got out of situations and turned some red lights into some green lights. 
So it's not a function of every day I get up and at this time, this is when I sit down and journal and I actively try to, you know, make a gratitude list or anything like that. It's not, no. it's, it's a more no. ephemeral kind no. of thing. No, it's more of a, I'm not a, it's more of a, uh, uh, you know, I like to say this way, you know, I've been working on this for about four years now. No audition. It's live. You're in the movie. <laughs> it's all happening. Life is the movie. You wake uh -huh. up. It's all, the record button is always on. It's always on. So when inspired, do it. The, 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 we don't have to preparation. Preparation what? Well, it's live. Go now. Do it. Quit talking about it. I mean, work it out. A lot of times being live is preparing. I'm a big preparer mm -hmm. for roles and work and preparing for things. But trying to look at it as like, I mean, I've also had times in my life where I sat there and prepared, 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 and looked up and three years later, I'm like, you never got in the game. You're still preparing, dude. Mm. What are you doing? Go, go. What are you so afraid of failing? Hop in the game of life, you know, or, or, or so, so yeah, it's more of a, um, it's more of been an instinct that I'm just now sort of defining. Mm. One of the things that you say in the book that that is really stuck with me. I mean, it, I highlighted a bunch of stuff, but this is the one that really stood out to me the most is this idea of being less impressed and more involved. Yes. I love that. And it's so concisely put and it's profound because it applies to so many things like less impressed with yourself, less impressed with other people, not trying to chase other people's ideas of what you should, could, need to be, yep. trying to find your moral center. And yep. the way to the path to that is to immerse yourself, to to give of yourself in service to others, but to be involved in your community, to you know, engage with the world in you know a deeper way. And engage with yourself in a deeper way. I mean, if I have a reverence for you, Rich, right now, oh my God, Rich, I, I, I can't. I'm, 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 you know how long I've been wanting to talk to you, man? I just think you're like that. You Trust and I, I'm fighting it right now, dude. I'm so happy to be talking to you. And it's like, I, <laughs> the people pleaser in me is what I'm trying to keep at bay so I can just be right. present and involved in this conversation. Well, if you if succumbed to that and you were going to go, oh, people please, you wouldn't be, if you were overly impressed with me, you wouldn't be involved in this conversation to the extent that you can be. Just like if I had that reverence for you to an that, that, you were above mortality for me. I couldn't actually be giving my true self to you in this conversation because I'm removed from it. And so if I have a reverence, I noticed it was soon after my father died when this came to me. Fame, money, people that I was like, wow. Uh, my dad's passing gave me the gift to go, no, all mortal things. Better look at them at eye level. At the same time, the underbelly of that is all the things you're patronizing McConaughey and looking down on and condescending and <laughs> sloughing off is not worthy, rose up to eye level and the world was flat. I could see wider, further and more clearly and I stood up straighter. I was a half inch taller and looked at the eye and go, welcome to the rodeo, buddy. Mm. Time to get, get on the bull, you know, quit relying on dad to make sure he's got your back if you fall off. That was part of being so it happens, you know? And so how do I do that? How do we do that with full respect? I have full respect for you. You can have full respect for me, but now we can still be involved in the conversation because if one person is on the, the pedestal above humanity and mortality, you can't be involved with it. And it's not right. even fair to that person. It happens in relationships. You'll see somebody in a relationship and I've been in them where, the female thinks I'm Superman and I think she's Wonder Woman. Well, that relationship ain't gonna go too far. Right. <laughs> because yeah. we're both holding each other on an unlivable expectation of a pedestal. Yeah. That neither one of us can live up to it. And we're neither one of us are really involved with each other humanly because we have such reverence for the other. Projection. So, yeah. Um, so I don't mean any lack of respect and I don't have less respect, I actually have more respect, but respect is a more mortal understanding to where I can, you and I can engage. But if I have too much of a reverence for you or anyone else, I can't really be involved with them. Hmm. And they can't be involved with me. Mm -hmm. So if, if, the, if, the, if the tables turn, so that's what that less impressed, more involved is. Um, you know, it's a bit of the, 
you know, the eye in the sky when you're in the, when they're in the palm and the hand of God or the cradle of when you, when you think you've got it uh, all figured out, go to that Google map POV and look at this little bitty dot on this spinning planet called earth. And this whole thousand of years that the hands of time move and you notice how meaningless <laughs> you are. And you, we look at it and we go, Oh geez, none of it matters which is a very liberating feeling. Oh, good. Takes the pressure off. Jeez, none of it matters. But at that same time, what has happened to me is I've gone, oh, and that's exactly why it all matters. Oh, here we go. Now we're on the bull. Now we're riding. You know, just when I saw how little I mattered is usually when it's come to me how much it all matters. Well, there's a humility in that, right? And I think humility is hard to come by for for everybody in certain times throughout their life. But, you know, for somebody who kind of exists in the world at this strange, uh, you know, level of stratosphere, um, how do you, like, the connection to that kind of humility so that you can be involved in the world? I mean, is that... You always seem to carry yourself with that, and you've never not had that. And I have to imagine that part of that is because you've made this choice to, you know, be in the world in a certain way, whether it's you know at the RV park or you know on the Amazon or you know wrestling in Africa. <laughs> that like right. that keeps you grounded and level-headed about you know who you are and where you where you sit you know in the grand scheme of everything. Yeah, well, also some of those experiences I've had have been better than fiction for me. You know what I mean? Some of those stories, I'm like, oh, geez, if Hollywood wrote this, no one would believe it. Mm. You know, so they were more extraordinary in ways to me at the time. Um, you know, humility, I, that's, a, that's been a, a word that I've wrestled with all, all my life because for so long I had the wrong definition of it. Humility, to be humbled. Humility. We all say have humility, but no one likes to be humiliated. Oh, well, wait a minute. What's the nexus of that word? How can I be humble, but still confident? How can I be humble, but still have identity? It wasn't until a few years ago. And I think this definition came, I think it's Jordan Peterson. Um, the definition of humility, which I, I do purchase, which is it's admitting you have more to learn. Um, and that definition, I lose no confidence or lose no identity in, but in very quick to go, yep, I got more to learn. Now, if I can call that humility and go into the world every day going, I know I have more to learn. I can move confidently with that humility and be humble. But boy, my early definitions of humility in, in my mind were almost a arrogant false modesty. Oh, no, 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 that don't, mm. no, no, no. You know, and, I, and I remember this, I'm gonna tell you that this was a, I, I've harked back to this moment in high school, there was a girl, Renice Sherman. And I remember I showed up to school one day, I was a junior and she, she was a friend. She was a friend of mine. We never dated. She was just a friend. She goes, she's coming. She goes, you know what, Matthew McConaughey, you are a handsome man. And I went, Oh, come on. No, no, Renice, don't grab that. And she grabbed my hand sternly and looked me in the eye. And she goes, don't you dare give me that. I don't know. No, 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 no. She goes, you know what you need to do when someone gives you a compliment like that? That's true. I go, what? She goes, say, thank you. And I remember going, oh, oh, wow, oh, oh, okay. And it hit me, but I didn't learn really how to live and understand humility. It was always almost a regressive feel. It's like the word vulnerability. I'm still wrestling with what that word means um, and how to feel, still feel empowered in that. Part of what I've, I've come up with that, I, that I, it helps me understand that, my relationship with the words humility and vulnerability, is that like, I know I want to be in the know. I love being in the know. But I'm still learning to be in the know is also knowing what you don't know. Mm. I want to know what I don't know. So that's another version of understanding the, the definition of humility for me that it feels like it empowers me, but still has me be humble. Mm. Well, a close cousin of that, those ideas, humility, vulnerability is, is authenticity. And, you know, your arc and your journey is very much one of you know, trying to get closer to who the authentic Matthew is, at least that's what I got out of the book. Yes. Um, and I think a, a really powerful kind of illustrative, illustrative example of that is the reconnaissance itself. Can we talk about that a little bit? Sure. Because sure. it's such an epic pivot, you know, which is another theme in your book. Um, 
I don't know if this is a spoiler, but you you uh, admit in the book that you're the one who actually came up with that word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I would not have thought. So that's that's being vulnerable to admit that you're the one who who crafted that. And then look my what it became. Said, my, that's the one piece of the book that my wife still had. Yeah. Did you really need to put that in there? It's going to sound so arrogant. And I was like, no, I, I thought it was great. I'm I like, I'm admitting I'm it, myself. you know? I admitted it. It was, yeah. look, I felt, I was aware enough at the time that I running a few, uh, on a run of a few films that were, that had their, you know, relative hits and, and that made their mark. And I was getting some, you know, ad adulation. I mean, people were, people in the interviews were going, man, you're really on a great run here. Da, 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 really on a great, and it came to me that this term like, you're on this great run, you're on this great run. And I was in, I think, Telluride or one of those film festivals. And I said, being a lover of bumper stickers and slogans, I was like, I got to give this like an album. I got to give this like a uh -huh. title of an album here. You know, this sounds this little movement I'm on that people are saying I'm on. So I was like, reconnaissance. I said, well, I can't come forward and say, yeah, I call it the reconnaissance. <laughs> but in this interview, and I thought about it just at the moment, the guy went on the interview was going, yeah, you've been on this run. Whoa, 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 whoa. You've been, and I was like, yeah, I was talking to a reporter the other day and he actually called it a reconnaissance. He goes, a reconnaissance? He goes, yeah. And he goes, oh, that's great. I love it. Reconnaissance. <laughs> you like that? And I'm like, yeah. I mean, shoot. He said it sounded like it comes off the tongue pretty easy. Sounds pretty cool to say. I'm, I'm with it. Well, he wrote that and then it picked up and right. people started calling it reconnaissance. And I just kind of went with it. And so then in the book, I decided to say, you know what? I'm the one who planted that seed. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I think that's hilarious, man. Um, but what's what's amazing about it, I mean, everybody knows the story. They know the movies you were doing and then the movies you ultimately ended up doing. Um, but that period, I, what I didn't realize was how much intention and mindfulness went into making that pivot. That it yeah. wasn't, um, first of all, it went on longer than I thought. And then also that it was very much planned. Like if I can't do things that interest me, that intrigue me as an artist and as a human being, like I'm going to, I'm going to opt out purposefully and be willing to suffer the consequences of not making any income and having your wife, you know, by your side for that period of time. Now, you know, you, you it's not like you couldn't put food on the table, but still, it's scary, you know, in Hollywood to suddenly say, I'm not going to do that. Are you going to be obsolete? Will you ever work again? And you went through, you know, a, a really extended period of time where it wasn't clear that you were ever going to make your way back. No, it wasn't. And I didn't know how long the sort of sabbatical drought would go on. And I shed many a tear on my wife's shoulder. Uh, one, with what I, what I was getting from my career and what I wasn't getting from my career. Um, I was rolling with rom-coms at the time. I was rom-com McConaughey shirtless on the beach. And I looked that in the eye and still do and go, you damn right. I was. And those rom-coms paid rent for those houses that I had on the beach where mm. I went shirtless. Guilty fact. I remember but, seeing you on the beach one time in Mount. I think you were renting a house with Lance for a period of time. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. I was running yeah. down the beach and I saw you guys out there. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, so, but I looked at my life and I remember I just had a newborn, Camilla and I just had Levi. And so the one thing I knew I always wanted to be is a father now come true. And my life was full, man. My life was so vital. I would I had, had, I had more rage. I had more joy. I had more happiness. I laughed louder. I cried harder. It was just my life. The ceiling and the basement of my emotions were full in my life. But my work was like, oh, another rom-com. I love doing these, but oh, there's a new script. I think I could do that tomorrow morning. I think I could wake up and do that. And I was like, well, that's not bad, but geez, I want, I sure would like to do some work that scares me in the right way. That makes me go, Ooh, whew, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with this role, but mm -hmm. this is going to be an experience. And I wasn't getting those roles. So yes, I couldn't, the roles I wanted to do were not being offered. So because I couldn't do what I wanted to do, I stopped doing what I was doing. And I remember I called my money manager, how to do with my money. You've invested well, 
Okay, good, because I'm about to take off work and I don't know when I'll get work again. Called my agent. I, I talked to Camilla about it. And she said she repeated my dad's words to me. You know, okay, if we're going to do this, don't half-ass it. We're gonna, you're going to do it. So I said, no more rom-coms. Well, nothing came in. Nothing was offered except rom-coms for the first six months after that. And I have that, you know, how puritanical was I? <laughs> I have that great little story about getting an $8 million offer for a rom-com and reading it and going, it's a good script, but no, thank you. Then they came back and offered me $10 million. I said, no, thank you. Then they offered $12.5 million. And I said, ellipsis, ellipsis, ellipsis. No, thank you. Then they came back at 14.5. You know what I said? Let me read that script again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I read smokes. that script again. And you know what? It was better written than the original one that $8 million offer. It was had more angles. I saw more opportunities. I saw more ways I could make it work. It, mind you, it was the exact same words as the original script, mm -hmm. but at that offer, it was a better written script. But I said, no. And then that sort of seemed to get the signal across Hollywood. McConaughey's not bluffing. He's really not doing any rom-coms or action comedies right now. So what came in for the next year? Nothing, nothing. I mean, I check in with my agent every couple of weeks, but it was basically like nothing. Your persona non, persona non grata, nothing's coming in for you. Now we're 20, month, 20 months into the sabbatical. I'm in Texas. You haven't seen me in a rom-com. You haven't seen me shirtless on the beach. Everything that you expected to see me in that I would I'd sort of pigeonholed me into only being that and not considered for other roles. 20 months into that, all of a sudden, what I think happened is, some producers and directors in Hollywood went, you know, it'd be an interesting to cast for this role in Killer Joe, Paperboy, Mud, Magic Mike, True Detective, Dallas Buyers Club. You know, it'd be an interesting choice, a novel choice, McConaughey. But I would not have been a novel choice for those things 20 months earlier. Right. So the way I look at it is that was an unbranding time for me. Again, back to process of elimination. I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So I just said I had to eliminate what I didn't want to do anymore. And I unbranded for 20 months. No one knew where I was. And I wasn't also, I also was not in your household or on your TV screen or in your theater being what you had expected me to be. And so all of a sudden I became a new good idea. Right. And um, that was a, yeah, that was a sacrifice. And I didn't know when that damn thing was going to end or if it was. And I entertained different career paths. I entertained getting out of the entertainment industry altogether. I thought I might go be a fourth grade teacher. I thought I might be a, uh, a high school football coach. Uh, wow. You did seriously. You really do. That's, that's hard to believe. You really were doing that. Yeah. Wow. I, I thought I might get back into law. Um, I, I considered, you know, being an orchestral conductor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, there's a couple lessons in that. I mean, one is um, back to this idea of of magnetizing the green light. Like, ultimately, and and the second being, you know, saying no in order to get the yes, right? Like, you had to do. There was this palate cleanser that Hollywood had to endure to get to the point where suddenly you were a good idea when you weren't before. And that yes. required you to say no. I mean, I don't know how many people, you know, have the gumption to say no to $15 million to do a movie for a couple months. Ultimately, it pays off and it shows the power of that, but it takes a lot of fortitude and conviction to commit to something like that and faith and belief to foresee that at some point it's going to pay off. Yeah. Well, you look at the Australian story when I was an exchange student for a year. Uh, I couldn't even believe that story. It's, it's all true. true. <laughs> have you well, have you gotten back in touch with that family? Yeah, every time I do Australian press, uh, <laughs> they usually show up on screen. Oh my god! <laughs> and um, you know that year, uh huh. You know, before I went on that year, the Rotary Club who sponsored me wanted me to sign the contract to say I won't come home until a full year's done. And I said, no, what do you want me to sign that for? I'm going for a year. And they go, no, that's what everybody says. But you're going to get homesick. You're going to want to come home. And I said, no, nah, you know what? I'll shake your hand on it, but I'm not signing that thing. Well, they agreed on a handshake. And I agreed on a handshake. Well, trust me, you read that year. There are many times I had full good reason 
to get the hell out of Dodge and come back home. But I was like, no, man, I'm in this. I've got to finish it out. There's something in this for me. There's a green light in this hardship experience that I'm going through, this insanity I'm going through. There's a reason for it. So stick with it. Don't pull the parachute. Well, same thing with, uh, um, you know, the, the sabbatical of, of, of not working. Once I was in it, I was like, I'm not going. I'm not, I'm in. I almost mm -hmm. gained more confidence as I went going, no, this is getting gnarlier with every day. You're not kidding. It's getting, <laughs> gnarly. Oh, you're in it now. McConaughey. This is, this is, this is upside down and backwards. Stick with it. There's really something good, good to come out of it. So when those jobs did come that I wanted to do, I was ferocious on those things. Mm. I, I mean, I, my fangs were long and I chewed them up and went hardcore into them. Um, so yeah, it was by saying no. Um, and I have, you know, there's great, Prudence and sticking through, sticking with resistance. You know, I mean, look, mm. let's talk about this with this time we're in. I wish COVID was gone tomorrow, wish it would have never been here. So I want to preface this next thing I say with that. But as a people, individuals in a society, is there value in it? to ourselves, even though we will have more tragedies and even losses of life, is there more, will we have a greater value and understanding of a green light in the future if we're in it for longer because we paid the penance longer, because we were stripped to our necessities longer, because we went through this resistance longer and it, we were pulling our hair out of our head. So when we come out of it, we don't just snap back to right where we were before. Because we're, us humans are, are, are tricky, man. We, 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 can, we can say we go through change. We intellectually talk about it. But boy, we go right back to old habits like that. Mm. Even bad habits, we go back to them. And so unless it's the consequences are enough or the unrest or the disruption and goes on long enough for us to go, no, my floor has literally been moved. I am changing my priorities about what I value in life because of this hardship. It has to go on. Things we, we're, we're, we're sort of... <laughs> Our muscle memory switches goes right back to yeah. where we used to be pretty quickly, unless it's a long enough penance to pay. You can't be the phoenix unless you burn. You got to burn first. Got to burn. Got and it's got to be in and, and, and like. You, it's got to burn. You got to look down and you got to find. It's a lot of times we have to yeah. be scarred, not like ooh that was hot, and not like ooh it left a little black mark. Like oh shit, no, I got a scar that's there for life from getting burned. Oh well now. I'm really making the change. I mean, we're, 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 uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, uh, we're hard headed like that. Mm. You know what I mean? As, as people, we, again, we intellectualize that oh, these things change, but very quickly, quickly, we, we reverb right back to our old habits, even if they're bad ones, unless the penance has gone on for a long enough time. Yeah. There's always opportunities in these, in these, setbacks and in this moment of forced repose, you know, amongst the economic challenges and everything that so many people are enduring right now, there's the general discomfort of being still with oneself that's so difficult, right? Like this mirror is up in front of us and it's forcing us to reckon with how we're living our lives because we can't move right now. We have to be in that discomfort and it's debilitating for a lot of people, but if you can open your aperture to it, there's so much to be learned from that. And you don't have to go right. to the Amazon. We're stuck at home on Zoom, but we have that we opportunity. Got, open your aperture to it. We are in a forced winter right now. And many of us, including me, needed to take one ourselves anyway. Well, now it's take, it, it, we, we all got the permit. We're all on it. We got our forced winter. It's forced time to be introspective, time to do inventory, whether you want to or not. Strip down the necessities. What do we got? How do I navigate? Who am I? Oh, I can't go anywhere. Well, what's one of our, you know, part of pulling the parachute is, well, I need to go out. I'm going out. I'm going out to dinner. I'm going to go. Come on, let's go get together. I can't, it's, there's some prudence in being forced with ourselves. And hopefully we're taking, enough of us can take the opportunity that's there in that to evolve yeah. in this time. Yeah. How do you feel about this, you know, later chapter in the reconnaissance of you becoming like this guru, you know, this person of wisdom that I don't know when it began, maybe it began when you gave that commencement speech, but at some point you kind of went from Matthew the actor into 
somebody who you know was was basically imparting life lessons to the world like how do you think about that or how do you feel about that was that intentional or is it just a byproduct of of who you are i think it started off more of a byproduct and then has gained some intention along the way um you know to go back to that uh it's live we're all on the show the recording the camera's mm-hmm. always recording you know and uh and to say ask myself are you making legacy choices for yourself right now mcconaughey are you living in a way live that is useful for yourself and others um look i'll say this i go back to university of texas and i had an idea for this script to screen class as a professor mm-hmm. But in my mind, I'm still like, I'm talking to the students. I feel like I was there the other day. But then I start sharing things with them and they're going like, whoa, that's awesome. Thank you for telling me that. I'm like, oh, that wasn't obvious? And I'm like, no, we didn't know that. And so I started to go, well, wait a minute. You got 28 years of experience of acting and being on sets, Matthew. Oh, geez, that's right, add that up. You do have some experience that may be innate to you now that is novel to a student. So. You do have something to share, some experience to share that maybe someone else didn't have. Um, I, you know, dip sharing this this book has got quite a few tools in it for how to find our frequency individually and hopefully as a collective. We're going through a time right now of great distrust. We don't know what to believe in. You don't trust uh, trust others. You all of a sudden you look up. You don't trust yourself, and that little revolution can go back and forth. Well, now I don't trust myself. Now I really don't trust you. Uh, now I don't believe myself. Now I don't, I don't believe in anything. And those are dead end streets, uh, ultimately. So how do we rebuild some trust? I think it's through values. I think values are bipartisan, non-denominational. I think those are the solid stepping stones that we need to each look in the mirror and ask ourselves what we can be better at on a daily basis. And that'll be incremental steps out of this time into hopefully a more evolved state mm-hmm. that we can get get out of and mm. help us look back at 2020 as an actual red banner year of recreation and recreation and, and, and a new beginning. Um, I try to share what I know. I also try to share what I don't know. I share questions a lot. Um, people, for instance, come to me a lot about, oh, they love the Fauci, Dr. Fauci interview I did. Right. I didn't reveal anything novel in that. I, like everybody, was just saying like, can I get a bullet point sheet on the, the to do's and the not to do's? And can you just say them for me real clearly? Because there's no consensus here, man. And can you just give me not the, not the long version and just the short, yes, no, do this, don't do that. And so I just went on a rapid fire with him and didn't ask questions that have not been brought up. They just hadn't been sort of, for a lot of people, hadn't been brought up in a succinct way. Mm-hmm. So I said, you know, do I have a, a platform where maybe someone else already knows that information, but maybe I got a platform where someone else is going to hear it and maybe listen to me in a way they wouldn't listen to someone else or maybe they didn't hear it. Before. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, let's go have those conversations. Um, the minister of culture work I'm doing right now is a lot based on that. And that's me, you know, saying I'm stepping into playing my favorite character. That's me saying, go play you in the character of you in life, the things that wake you up at two in the morning that I've been writing down in my diary since I was 14. It's always about culture, about how do we get along? What's our individual responsibilities? How do we get to freedom? How are we responsible for freedom? And how does freedom have its responsibilities? What should I expect of you? What should you expect of me? Can we have a social contract here as humans? You know, because right now our social contracts are broke. Right. Um, where are my person? Why, why are they broke? Well, partially, maybe I broke my own social contract. Maybe I've let myself slide on things and to go out and act like I have a social contract with you, I'm just acting like one and not being one. Well, wait a minute. I'm not gonna let that pass. I gotta be one. I I need to be one, that voluntary obligation. We need to make voluntary pledges with ourselves of what we expect of ourselves so we can expect it from others. And if we get that reciprocity going, then enough of us do that, then we collectively make change. The other idea is this, we gotta remember we're never gonna arrive. There's not a destination. Yeah. Man. I don't, you know, I, it's, 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 it's like our lives and say America, the Langston Hughes poem, America yet. That's what should we, we should be chasing yet. We never get there with the social uh, the cultural revolution. We're going, we're not going to get to perfect justice, but if we can make an incremental ascension forward, that's it. Stay in the race, commit to the chase and with ourselves. 
can we just keep chasing our better selves a little bit and know we're going to screw up along the way? Can America just keep, we're an aspiration. Our lives are an aspiration. America is an aspiration. It's a chasing of yet. Um, and I think that's what we ultimately are is, is, is individuals. We we're all should be, ch we all should be chasing ourselves. What more fun, wild, adventurous thing to chase in your life than yourself? Well, there's a there's an unbridled optimism to that that's infectious and that I love. Uh, and I don't want to take up too much of your time. We can we can end it on this. Uh, you know, I, I can't let you go without digging a little bit more deeply into kind of where we're at um, in this American experiment right now. We're headed into an election. We are extremely divided. Communities, families, individuals are having difficulty finding common ground, being able to even effectively communicate. And there is this, um, you know, layer of, of whether it's fake news or misinformation that's confusing people and driving us apart. And I have this sense of us fracturing and I'm trying to figure out how to get my hands around it, how I can communicate with my brothers and my sisters, how I can be more empathetic. Like how can we look to what unites us, to our commonalities, which are so much more robust than the details that might divide us on paper or on social media. But I find myself concerned about what I'm seeing and where we're heading. So how do yeah. we how do we write the ship, Matthew? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Solve this problem for me. And for here. us. Oh wow. Yeah, right. Um you know, I was talking about earlier, yeah, it is times of great distrust uh, in others, in ourselves. Our social contracts are broken. Our personal contracts are broken. We don't have expectations of ourselves or others. Right now, the private sector down to the individual has more power than ever. We can't trust our leadership. Politics is a broken business. Uh, what do we want? People are wanting security. Well, we're all individuals. Wait a minute. What's, where's the collective? Uh, it's a, we got to, we got to, all this is being politicized along the way. The body counts are being added up for which side of the which side of the aisle wants to win. That's the only numbers each side is counting. Um, we got an election year. Are we going to have a civil war? Man, can we just get to January 2021, which is a symbolic day, but nothing more than a symbolic day? Do we have a 10-year restoration? Do we have a 20-year restoration? I don't know how long. It'll go. What can we rely on? Uh, empathy, one thing. A little amnesty right now. It's a tough time for everybody. I don't know how to make a collective change. I don't know how to make an overall systemic change or a law. I don't think people want to be legislated like that. I think it, again, comes down to each one of us need to look in the mirror and go, how can I be a little bit better? What can I do a little bit better? I don't have to be great. I don't have to be perfect. There is no best. I can be a little bit better. How can I be a little more fair? How can I understand that my brother and sister are also hurting, maybe in more in different ways than I am? How can I have a conversation without a condemnation? How can I have more patience to take a breath and listen and let someone who hasn't been heard speak more loudly than maybe they need to, but, but hear them? How do we make this time not just a flash in the pan, uh, how do, how do we be honest where the choices we make for ourselves selfishly are also the best choices for the most amount of people. And then, and then there's not any specific recipe for that, but take that into consideration when we make our choices for ourselves. Um, again, responsibility and freedom. We're going to have to build our way out of this time. We're going to have to break a damn sweat for a while. And I think we have to have that long view that feeling like this is gonna go on for a while. Now, how can we make that a part of our daily instincts of how we go about our lives? How do we treat ourselves? How do we treat our loved ones? How do we treat our employees? How do we treat people we work with? How do we treat what we're building? And what, are we, are we just for profit or are we for purpose as well? Uh, what's our purpose? I'm not interested in politics. I'm interested in some purpose though. Politics is a broken business. We don't know who to trust. So that's what I mean by the private sector down to the individual. You have more power right now to define your future than ever. Um, Cause you actually don't have anywhere, anyone else uh, up there, no institution to rely on <laughs> for that guidance. So I understand it, man. Some of us are going, well, what the hell, man? Give me a map. I don't know what to trust in. I don't know what's a consensus here. Um, some of us are gonna do well right now cause we can just keep our head above water. 
just try and make it through this time. It's going to pass. We're going to be moving forward. We are not turning the page yet, though. When the time comes to turn the page on COVID, when the time comes to turn the page on the Cultural Revolution, the only way it's going to work is that the collective, all of us, every color, every, if you've got COVID, if you don't, every color of skin, do it together to some form or fashion. I think, you know, as much as we are a nation of individuals and love our individualism, we are failing in, at any sort of collective responsibility. Mm. We have failed with the mask of seeing that as a civic duty instead of a damn, don't you tell me what to do bullshit. It's, it's the wrong kind of selfish. It's actually not a selfish move to, to, to fight those fights. There is a responsibility that we can choose to take for and with each other and ourselves. And those two are not exclusive. My hunch is it lies in values. My hunch is it lies in responsibility, accountability, risk-taking, sense of humor. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. That We can just be a little kinder, a little more fair, a little more empathetic, a little more understanding, a little more forgiving. Also holding on accountability. We, no, no, this isn't going to be a free ride. I'm not in for a world kumbaya. No, we gotta, we, it's going to take work. And the greatest thing about America is, when America's working right, is if you're willing to work at something and educate yourself and go after something, you – more so than anywhere else, should have the opportunity to achieve that. But not without the work and the education and the hustle to go do it. So, you know, I'd say this, man. Start off with trying to create more green lights for yourself and others and see where those two meet and see that actually being selfless is actually a very selfish act. Creating more for others is actually very selfish for yourself as well. And make sure you're trying to make sure your selfish choices for yourself also light the way for more people as well. Boom. Beautifully put. Thank you, man. That was incredible. I appreciate your time today. I, I enjoyed that was it. Super fun, man. Thank you. Uh, too, man. The book is incredible. Green lights available everywhere. October 20 is the day October it comes 20. out. That's right. October 20th this year. Um, you've been attacking this thing like it's the release of a blockbuster movie. Like all you, you've been out there, man. Like this is going big and wide. I can tell already. Well, that's how I'm approaching it. Look, this yeah. is the most truest permanent extension of me that I've ever been a part of. Mm. And to whatever extent, I'm, I'm, I'm honored with that. And, uh, and, I, and I want to. It's, it's, it's the first time, you know, if I look at it like a movie, which I have, I wrote it. I directed it. I edited it. You know what I mean? I, I did it. Yeah. So I'm not acting in someone else's script, being directed by someone else. So it's the truest permanent extension of me that I've ever put out mm. and that's scary and fun and all those things. And yes, I had to have my chin strap on and my mouth guard in while I was writing it. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, you did an incredible job. I, I love the book. I read it in like just two sittings. Um, it's super enjoyable. And I think it's going to, I think it's really, it's going to help a lot of people too. It's going to help a lot of people. I, I hope so. That'd be great. Cool. Um, all right. Hope to meet you in person one day. But until then, best, the trail, best, of luck right? with the, uh, best of luck with everything. Yeah, at some point, hopefully, we'll, we'll go do that trip with Dan. <laughs> Good deal. Thanks, dude. I appreciate it, man. Best of luck. Good to see you in person. Yeah, right on. Right on. Peace. Cool.